Tally Ho, Jules Guides here, in which I wander around London telling you fascinating facts. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you like these videos. And today, we are on the trail of Sherlock Holmes, the world's most famous detective. And I've got with me Little Lost Lou, who's going to help me investigate. She's kind of dressed a bit like a Baker Street Irregular. But Sherlock Holmes is the most portrayed figure in the history of all literature. He's been in over 25,000 representations of him in film, theatre, books, cartoons. He's an expert at boxing, fencing, and a master of disguise. He has incredible powers of deduction. He plays the violin, and he's a cocaine addict. They've really cashed in on Sherlock Holmes around here. Everything is relating to him. You've got Sherlock Bistro over there. You've got all the tiles in Baker Street Station have got little images of Sherlock Holmes on them. And look, there's even a splendid statue of the great man himself. So, of course, Sherlock Holmes lives at London's most famous address, 221B Baker Street. Of course, this didn't used to be 221B Baker Street. 221B would have actually been sort of over there where they had an Abbey National branch, and they used to receive loads of letters from fans who, who thought that Sherlock Holmes was a real person. Sherlock Holmes was actually written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle at the end of the 19th century, and he was a doctor from Edinburgh. But he had no idea that his fictional detective would become such a worldwide sensation that his popularity would still endure over 100 years later. My favourite Holmes is Robert Downey Jr. Could you tell me who your favourite Sherlock Holmes is? Lee Warner. Oh, right, so these are foreign homes. They're actually uh, in different countries. Yes. The amazing thing is, there's so many Holmeses, I haven't even heard of half of the ones that all these people are mentioning. Who's your favourite Holmes? Vasily Luanov. Which one? Uh, Soviet one. Oh, okay. Tell us who your favourite Holmes is. Enola. Huh? And, and no, and no, that's the female one, isn't it? Yeah. Sherlock Holmes has inspired so many different characters. Most importantly, a very important one, around the corner. His danger mouse. But they've missed out Penfold, who's the Dr. Watson character. There used to be a really cute little plaque down here saying that, you know, this is where Danger Mouse lived and he used to come out of the curb, but they've taken away the plaque. I think that's a pity. But look, these are actually taxi cabs, and it's quite nice because taxi cabs feature a lot in Sherlock Holmes stories. He's always taking a handsome cab. Call me a handsome Watson. You are very handsome Watson. interesting that in the books we meet Dr Watson before we meet Sherlock Holmes and he's actually the person that writes everything and, and narrates the stories so it's weird that they're called Sherlock Holmes and not Dr Watson. Yeah. Dr Watson is kind of similar to Arthur Conan Doyle yeah. because both of them were doctors and look Arthur Conan Doyle eventually he moved here to Wimpole Street because got Harley Street's just over there it's famously the streets for doctors around here and this is where he had his doctor's practice and he wrote some of his stories here in this house and decided that he didn't want to be a doctor and he was a much better a writer. There's still doctors who have their practice here today. Look, Dr. Malcolm Lindsay, Dr. Paul Simpkin. And funnily enough, it was on one of his lecturers at university that he based Sherlock Holmes. There was a fellow called Joseph Bell, and he was known to be able to enter a doctor's waiting room and diagnose the patients without even having to talk to them, purely using his amazing deductive reasoning powers. But how did Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson actually meet? The first Sherlock Holmes story was published in 1887 and it was called A Study in Scarlet in which Dr Watson runs into an old friend called Stamford who he meets here at the Criterion. Watson is just back from Afghanistan having been wounded and he arrives in London and he, he describes himself here. I had neither kith nor kin in England. I naturally gravitated to London, that great cesspool into which all loungers and idlers of the empire are irresistibly drained. That's a little bit harsh. <laughs> As they always do in typical Sherlock Holmes stories, they hail a handsome cab. St Bartholomew's Hospital, please, and don't spare the horses. How does Stanford describe Holmes well, to Watson then? It says here, a fellow who is working at the chemical laboratory up at the hospital. He was bemoaning himself this morning because he could not get someone to go halves with him in some nice rooms which he had found. And which were too much for his purse. So Holmes is skinned. <laughs> Thank you. 
So Watson and Stanford arrive here at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, which is the oldest hospital, I believe, in the UK, actually, certainly in London. And they go up the stairs, and there they find Sherlock Holmes doing lots of experiments with these test tubes and chemicals. He says to Watson, How are you? You have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? And here down North Gower Street is the 221B Baker Street that they used in the Benedict Cumberbatch version on the BBC. So that's, they cover that up with a light in the, well, they in the show. they keep Speedy's in it, don't they? Yeah, Speedy's is in it, but in the pilot episode, I think they call it Mrs Hudson's Snacks. Oh, and after that, they turn it back into Speedy's. Yeah. <laughs> Just starting now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julian. Hi, I'm Louise. So uh, are you here when they're filming it then? I was here and actually I am in one of the uh, episodes as well as an extra for the um, Victorian times. So that's a Benedict Cumberbatch but when he goes back to Victorian times? Yeah, yeah, he goes yeah, back yeah, in yeah, time. yeah, yeah. I watched that one, I just watched that one, it sounded like it was on last week actually. It was amazing, it was amazing. You know, completely different to what we looked That's you! But yeah, that's me. Well, I was young then, I was young then. Oh, look, you still look the same. You know, we get people from all around the world. China, Japan, America, Italy, all over the world. I'm not the first yeah. person to come and bother you then. No, no, no. Well, you're not the botherers. All of you are welcome. So, yeah, it's been a fantastic time. This is the Langham Hotel, and back at the end of the 19th century, this was the largest and most modern hotel in the city, and it was the first to have hydraulic lifts. And this is where, in 1889, Arthur Conan Doyle was commissioned to do his second novel, which was The Sign of Four. Actually, you might recognise the hotel from my afternoon tea video, which I highly recommend. Also, this stood in for the Grand Hotel Europe in the James Bond film Goldeneye. They didn't actually go to St. Petersburg, so it features in a lot of things. But it actually also features in A Scandal in Bohemia, the Sherlock Holmes story, in which the King of Bohemia is staying in this hotel, because he'll stay in the, one of the grandest hotels, of course. And in that story, we're also introduced to Irene Adler. She's the only one who ever manages to get the better of Holmes. She, yeah. she tricks him. And I reckon he finds it a bit sexy. To Sherlock Holmes, she was always the woman it was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. <laughs> After the first two books, didn't actually do that well. Fortunately for him, the Strand magazine, which was situated just up this road, Burley Street, they started publishing this a monthly magazine. And he decided, I know, I'm going to do short stories in the magazine. He was writing these short stories in it, but they replicated the magazine in America as well. And that's how it took his stories all over the world, really. The famous the look of him and everything was created by this illustrator, Sidney Paget. So the iconic image that we have of Sherlock Holmes today, of having the, the dear stalker cap he actually put the deer stalker cap in it wasn't even in the book they became so popular i mean he became an instant success with these short stories it made him a millionaire people were queuing around the block here it's very much like jules guide's book signing book. it was very similar to jules guide's book signing and uh, you can buy uh, jules guide's rather splendid london walks by following the links afterwards and just around the corner from the strand magazine offices is the Lyceum Theatre. Now, in the sign of four, Mary Morstan, who actually goes on to become Mary Watson, she marries Dr Watson. She arranges to meet somebody three columns from the left at the Lyceum Theatre, and uh, she's allowed to bring two friends, so obviously she brings Holmes and Watson. This is the first place that Sherlock Holmes appeared on stage in London. But actually, he appeared on stage first in America, played by William Gillette, and he was the first one to use one of these curved calabash pipes. It didn't actually appear in the book. He didn't describe a pipe like that. I think it was because he just wanted, he was vain and he wanted his face to be more visible to people in the audience. So that was an invention of his. And that was an American as well, strangely. Yeah. And he's actually the person that first coined the phrase elementary, my dear fellow, which then later on got developed into the famous elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementare Watson. Si, grazie. <laughs> Elementare. He never said elementary, my dear Watson in the books at all. just come to the British Museum and just opposite is the Museum Tavern over here. 
in the case of the Blue Carbuncle, this is where they come, isn't it? Well, it could be one of two pubs. A goose has been found with this priceless gem in its throat and <laughs> turns out that there was a Christmas goose club here at one of these pubs. And he describes it as being off one of these streets near the museum that heads off towards Holborn on a corner. He does actually say in the story that they go in through the private bar. Now this one, I don't think has a private bar door. So you reckon it's the plough? Well, I, See, the I, plow I think it's this one. Anyway, on the internet you can find all these maps and stuff and you can actually, if you are a real Sherlock Holmes aficionado, obsessive, you can actually do these Sherlock Holmes walks and you can follow the route that he takes. For example, the case of the Blue Carbuncle where the guy gets attacked and, and his goose gets thrown on the ground down in Good Street. Anyway, they come here to the, in the story, what they call the Alpha Inn. You see what I'm saying, man? I reckon this bit here... This you reckon that's been... the... Oh, yeah, you see? I think she might be onto something. You might be onto something here, Watson. <laughs> this is... Because he, he describes it as being they aim through the private bar. That so... one's only got two sort of main doors. This one's got a little secret door on the side. See what you're saying? Oh, well. Who cares? Let's go. <laughs> Now look, yes, we're in Pall Mall here. That is the Reform Club, and over there we've got the RAC. You remember when I, in my recent video about West Mayfair? Where, uh, about, yeah, yeah, you were down here, yeah. didn't you? You went, actually went in, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, because this is where, in the adventure of the Greek interpreter, we meet Mycroft Holmes, who's Sherlock Holmes' more intelligent older brother. And he lives on this side of Pall Mall, in rooms opposite his club, which he's often seen in the Diogenes Club. After he became very successful, Arthur Conan Doyle wanted to be all posh and come to these fancy clubs so he was a member there of the reform and he was also a member of the RAC over there and he was a member of this one right here the Athenaeum but in Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch they don't film it there the, the actual one they use is around here let's go and look over here hmm elementary my dear Watson there has been a crime, evidently, here at the British Academy in the BBC Sherlock series. This is the one which is Mycroft's club, the Diogenes Club. And Dr Watson makes a big scene by, by talking loudly. And I don't know if you've ever talked loudly in one of these gentlemen's clubs, but uh, they'll have your guts for garters. According to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, talking is on no account permitted in these London clubs. I say, Watson, you know my methods. What do you deduce from this hat? Well, it belongs to a gentleman who runs a YouTube channel. Very tatty. He has low intelligence because it's quite small size, so he's obviously got quite a small brain. And um, I think his wife doesn't love him. Do you mind? That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Conan Doyle's wife was actually a medium. She was something known as an automatic writer, where she spoke to the dead and delivered messages of hope to bereaved people. And there was often massive debates over whether it was real or not. But Arthur Conan Doyle himself was absolutely convinced by it, as am I. It's one of the reasons why I really got into Arthur Conan Doyle, more than Sherlock Holmes himself, actually. It reflects in his later stories. He was obsessed with trying to communicate with the dead. He had attended seances. He was often taken in by by these people who claim to be able to produce ectoplasm and things like that. There's a famous incident of the Cottingley fairies where these two children had taken photographs of fairies. He was absolutely convinced by it. <laughs> So why have you brought us to this bookshop in Cecil Court? Well, Watkins Books is the oldest esoteric bookshop in London and it's over 100 years old, so he almost certainly would have come here when he was in those spiritualist Let's years. Go in. in a very broad sense, it can be described as a mind-body-spirit bookshop, at least that's what it has evolved into. It was originally a more occult bookshop with books relating to the Golden Dawn, the Theosophical Society, Eastern mysticism. Right. The shop moved to this site about 1901. Arthur Conan Doyle probably yes. came into this book. It, it, it is extremely likely, given his interests, and in, there wasn't really anywhere else in London where you could get this sort of thing at that time. In the later years, 
Arthur Conan Doyle's stories, the Sherlock Holmes stories, they started getting more and more weird, like with stories like the Devil's Foot and the Sussex Vampire and the Creeping Man, which was this really weird one where this professor invents some sort of elixir where he's taking some serum from monkey's testicles and injecting himself and then he becomes, so he actually turns into a bit of a monkey with his knuckles scraping along the ground. It's very weird. Look at this amazing building. This is the Freemasons Hall. And speaking of mysticism, in the Robert Downey Jr. version of Sherlock Holmes, Lord Blackwood, who has recently risen from the dead, conducts a secret meeting in there. And there's, there's lots of symbols all over the place and lots of it really feels quite mystical in there. They, they film a lot of stuff inside this building, actually, which is probably, probably why they, they shot it there. And funnily enough, Arthur Conan Doyle was also a Freemason. Who's your favourite? I mean, I think the old traditional one, obviously Basil Rathbone. There's another one called Elementary, the one set in New York with Johnny Lee Miller, where Lucy Liu plays Dr. Joan Watson. What about Jeremy Brett, though? He's like definitely one of the. He's definitely it's, a classic host. It, he became more and more eccentric. He was really. Yeah, he was like so that. over. Ha! So, I, I was told once by one of my ex boyfriends that Doctor Who was actually based on Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Doctor Who is like the Sherlock Holmes character. Then yeah. he has this companion with him, but the trusty assistant. And then there's the master is Professor Moriarty, this oh, arch criminal. Because now we have all these modern versions of Sherlock Holmes, don't we? And it's, so, it's almost like they're updated. Sherlock Holmes is like a time lord himself, like the doctor, because he's time traveled. He's gone from the 1800s to the 21st century as with Benedict Cumberbatch. This is St Bartholomew the Less Church. We're just back here at St Bartholomew's Hospital, which is all around us here, because this features in quite a lot of the Sherlock episodes in the BBC version, because this is where Molly Hooper works, which she's the one who's totally in love with Sherlock. Now, poor old Arthur Conan Doyle really wanted to be a serious writer. He didn't really want to be writing these silly detective stories, so eventually he just decided, you know what, I'm going to kill off Sherlock Holmes. And in order to do so, he created the arch nemesis, the Napoleon of crime who was Sherlock Holmes's arch enemy, Professor Moriarty. Now in the book they fall to their deaths through the Reichenbach Falls in Switzerland but in the BBC stories and also in Jules Guides because I can't go all the way to Switzerland, Benedict Cumberbatch jumps off that building doesn't he? And Dr Watson is around this side of this funny little brick building here and he's convinced that Holmes has fallen to his Holmes, death. Where are you? Where are you Julian Holmes? Where are you? Julian Holmes? What's happened? Are you dead? Actually, I remember when Doctor Who died, he was defeated by the Master and he falls. It's deliberate as yeah. well. The original artwork that Paget did of the picture, the iconic bit of artwork of them two falling to their deaths there in the books, that actually sold for over $200,000 in auction. And just a mere stone's throw from there is the Church of St Bartholomew the Great just down here. And in the Robert Downey Jr. version, this is where Lord Blackwood is preparing a human sacrifice and he's apprehended. <laughs> Wonderful. I ejaculated. <laughs> uh, so it is funnily enough, it is amusing that it's mostly Watson, he ejaculates a lot in the, in the stories. Now Watson, said Holmes, rubbing his hands, we have half an hour to ourselves. Simple, I ejaculated. Simple, I ejaculated. <laughs> The game is afoot. We've come to a special Sherlock Holmes event, which you can attend, which is in West Kensington. How do you get in touch with these people? About how, what, what's the name of it online? They're called the Lost Estate. The Lost, the Lost Estate. Lost Estate. Okay. And they're in West Kensington. In West Kensington. And you come along and they give you all this stuff. Like uh, we've got we, we, we've got a codicil, a will, uh, all this sort of death certificate. And, and we're going to see the solving of this crime. Dawn was breaking as we arrived at Batman. I'm not used to making such elementary mistakes. As clumsy as I've been, you surely do not imagine I neglected to get enough of the cat. 
There he is. Look, he's not dead. Good it's afternoon. Holmes. Hello. There he is. I miraculously survived. My name is Samuel Collins, and I am playing Sherlock Holmes in an adaptation of The Hound of the Baskervilles. Okay, so how did you survive this uh, amazing fall? Well, he had to essentially fake his own death. Are you an expert in Japanese wrestling? I think, did I read that right? Is you are he... absolutely correct. That is how he slips from Moriarty's grip on the edge of the falls, indeed. Why did uh, Arthur Conan Doyle bring him back? Well, he had originally wanted to focus on his own historical novel writing, which was his passion, and he thought was far superior to his home stories. But of course, um, they were not anywhere near as successful as the, the goose that laid the golden egg. The Sherlock Holmes stories had been so unbelievably popular. People would walk around London, with black armbands, mourning Sherlock Holmes. That is because on this occasion, Watson, you were correct on two things, which is at least one more than usual. Mortimer is certainly a country practitioner and walks a good deal as to the rest of it. Why do you think he has lasted so long? He's been going for years and years and he's just still on the stage now. Because of his absolute sheer popularity and the brilliance of the writing. He is an impossible creation to try and bring to life, but that's the joy of it. How exactly can people get a 10% discount? Follow the link below and use a 10% discount code, Jules Guides. Traditionally, Jules Guides always finishes in a pub. Can you recommend a pub to go to? Oh, Jules, as always, you see, but you do not observe. Sherlock Holmes Pub, you'll be very welcome there. Cheers, Louisa. Cheers, Simon. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you like the videos. And if you want to go and see The Hound of the Baskervilles with the, uh, the Lost Estate, you can hit the link in the text description below and they will give you a 10% discount. And don't forget to buy my amazing book, all available on my website, jewelsguides.com. See you next time.